Thank you very much for uh, the invitation to give this talk and to present the work that I did with uh, Professor Harold Barangier at Duke University and Professor Eduardo Muchillo at uh, University of Central Florida. And uh, this is a little bit of a change of gear because we came from a different background from condensed matter and when we start looking at this problem, um, we were kind of confused on how to go from a microscopic Hamiltonian to the threshold and to the error, quantum error correction and the threshold theorem from um, that we learned a lot yesterday. So, and first of all, there is a conundrum, right? A problem in quantum error correction is that you would like, or with quantum computation, right? You would like to protect your qubit as much as you can, isolating it from the environment. But uh, nevertheless, you need to interact with it, read it, and, and operate on it. So uh, in any way, even if you really protect well your computer, there's, there will be some residual noise, and eventually you're going to need to use error correction. So it's believed, I think, that uh, we can safely say that some sort of error correction will exist in the end of the day, unless you go to the topological quantum computation. So, the basic idea here is that you have, or in quantum, in traditional QEC theories, that you, you need fast measurements, but this has been shown not to be fundamental by Oliferis and the Vincenzo. Um, you also have to worry about, what well, you're doing gates fast or slow, and eventually most of the work is done with error models. So today I'm going to actually talk about these two last steps about fast gates and slow gates and error models, when it's okay or not to use them. So an important result that we learned yesterday, right, is the threshold theorem. That if you're below a certain noise strength, then you can uh, protect your quantum computer for arbitrary long times. And, uh, and so, but in, in this paper in 2000, Dori Taranov um, made a very nice uh, analogy with the theory of quantum to classical trace transitions. Right? If you are below uh, error probability for a qubit, then you are in a resilient, uh, you are in a strong entanglement, you can have strong entanglement between the qubits, and you are in the low temperature regime, where resilient quantum computation is, uh, is okay. It's, or if you are above a certain noise strength, right, the quantum computer is noisy and you lose that possibility of creating strong entanglement between your qubits. This is like the high temperature regime of your computer. So, what if, what, to, what if we would like to start from a microscopic Hamiltonian for your computer? Right? So the standard description, prescription is to use the quantum master equation and dynamical semigroups. This is definitely a very natural approach. You're not interested in an environment. So you trace it out and um, follow the evolution of the computer. Okay. But you pay a price, usually you pay a price to do that. And the price is the Born-Markov approximation. So you first need to do the Born approximation, which is second order perturbation theory. And then you, use the mark, you, you need to apply the Markov assumption. So in, um, in a paper recently, Aliki, Lidar, and Zanardi also criticized this approach, right? And I think we're going to learn about it after lunch. And uh, the reason is that fast gates and chillers in the Markovian bath may be inconsistent with each other. Okay. So what is the problem with the Markovian approach? Well, before you go to the Markovian assumption, you need to go through the Born approximation. And in fact, the Born approximation is the weak spot of the method. And that's where actually I'm going to focus about my discussion. So, and the quantum master equation with the Born-Markov approximation is a reasonable description, but not for all the systems. So it's a reasonable description in NMR, in laser physics, and in many chemical reactions, but it really fails, uh, can f fail strongly in solid state physics at low temperatures, where neither the Born approximation is valid nor the Markov assumption is valid. So 
we don't want to use the Born approximation. And this was done before, right? So in a series of papers, and here are some of them. So, and, but usually what do you need is to, the, what you do is to define uh, the evolution with one error. You take the evolution operator and you take the identity out and you find a bound to the norm. So this is, the this is related to the probability of having one error in the evolution of the computer, where you took the average over the largest eigenvalue of the interacting, uh, or the largest eigenstate of the, of the system, eigenstate of the interacting Hamiltonian. The problem that we want to focus, so this only makes sense if this error probability is very small, as Professor Gottsman told us yesterday. So the problem is how to deal with the case where your interacting Hamiltonian is unbound, where this largest eigenvalue is very large, or is, is very large, or when you're looking at times that are very long. So before we go to the error correction, let me just give a different prescription that we can look at. The first thing that you, should, that you assume is a free Hamiltonian for the environment and a perturbation of this form. So now if you uh, take the ground state, for example, of your environment and take the average and assume that it has a, a very general form of this two, for the two-point correlation functions, and you apply these ideas into the norm, right? So instead of using the largest eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, I'm using the ground state. Then you see that uh, this is just one minus the uh, time-ordered cosine for the interacting Hamiltonian. So the, pro the question now is how to look at the perturbation theory expansion of this parameter L lambda. So you expand the cosine and you ask yourself, is this a good approximation or a bad approximation? So if, when you do that, you see that there is always, for each order in lambda to, to the m, in each order m of the perturbation, there will be a term that is can be really bad depending on the parameters of your correlation functions, the dynamical exponent c and the dimensions of your systems that scales like the size or the time of this and the time that you're looking at. So perturbation theory around this no interacting ground state, right, may be a very bad idea to start if d plus e minus delta, which delta is the scaling dimension of the, um, the perturbation, is larger than zero. Okay, so in the theory of this is the theory of quantum phase transitions, right? Uh, this is a well-known thing. So d plus z, right, define what is called the upper critical dimension. When you're above this upper critical dimension, this is the scaling dimension of the perturbation. Perturbation theory works fine, and you can systematically you can expand your cosine and then in this case and systematically improve your perturbation as you need it. So if there is a, also a, the idea of a lower critical dimension, if you are below this number, right, if your scaling dimension is below that, then perturbation theory should not work at all, and you need to do something different. And, uh, and there is a region between the lower and the upper critical dimension where you can do something else. We have to do something else or have substantial corrections to your perturbation theory. So we're going to try to use this same kind of idea in the non error correction scheme. So what is the main message? The main message that I want to convey here is that the dynamic that you impose by QEC, right, which is encoding, extracting the serum, and recoding, right, actually uh, separates, naturally separates the environment in two components, uh, the environmental mode. One is a high component, high frequency component, which happens inside an error correction period, a cycle, and a low frequency component, which connects perturbations on different error correction cycles. And precisely this separation of scales tells us that there is something special and nice about error correction that already protects you a little bit from correlations. So if we need additional protection, we can also do some software methods to actually reduce the effect of correlations between different error correction cycles. And all my discussions should also be uh, considering in the view of another paper by Arnov, Kitayev, and Preskill from 2006, 
where they use a completely different approach and get uh, in a different problem and get a very similar result. So just a small summary, right? You first you encode your information, then you let the system evolve, you extract your syndrome and uh, correct the system and start the cycle again. So what are the quantities that we want to calculate? The first quantity that it's nice to calculate is the probability of a given history of your syndromes. You are taking out information from your system, which are the syndromes, and, uh, and so you can have a probabilistic, you have a probabilistic history of having an error in the first period or no error and uh, an er a, known error, a known error or an error in the second and so on and so forth. So what you would like to do is to find out what is the probability of having any one of these paths. So why this is important? Because here are the corrected errors. And um, that's, these are the probability, that's what you're looking at, right? You're extracting the syndrome. And the uncorrected errors, the ones that you don't have control with, are also coming together with each, each one of these paths. So there is always some residual decoherence. So if you find the most probable path here, then you can also estimate the residual decoherence that comes from the uncorrected errors. Okay. So let's consider an environment that is defined by a, a free field theory and an interaction with this general form where you have a function of the environmental ver environment variables and uh, the spin variables, the qubit variables. So, what about slow gates and fast gates? If this is the microscopic Hamiltonian and you apply fast gates, that's fine. This is the microscopic, this is the Hamiltonian that we should look at as the one that we're going to do the perturbations. If you have a slow gates that are much lower than the cutoff of the free theory, free field theory, then there's a convolution between the operators and uh, as you do the gates between the operators and the, the, of the control fields and, and the environment. But you can define an effective V that is an upper bound to this, uh, to, to this convolution. And the first part, so the fast gates are nice for theory because you have a noise with a structure. The slow gates are probably more important to, to study, but uh, they're less interesting from the, the perspective that I want to do because they are, uh, they, they kind of um, average noise in all directions. So the noise structure, the noise loses its internal structure or this gr its group structure. But nevertheless, both of them can be studied and they have exactly the same form, F sigma. But you need to re remember always that if you're considering slow gates, then F is an average that we, it's well defined. And uh, if you're looking at slow gate, this is the microscopic Hamiltonian. Okay, so now if you have a quantum evolution, you expand it in all the orders. And at the end of each, each error correction cycle, this quantum evolution takes out some of the terms of this evolution. And the reason for that is because you extract the syndrome. So if I have a sigma, if I measure a sigma Z error, I, my evolution for that error, error correction cycle was only the evolution given by uh, one term here on, the, well, the first term of this series, sigma z, and then all the other terms on the series that the products of the qubit variables give me a sigma z. So for each evolution, each syndrome that I extract, I have a different operator that gives me the evolution for that cycle. So we you start with trying to calculate the probability, for example, you start with uh, your original um, wave function and then you evolve it in time. Each one of these is one error correction cycle which has a different operator because I extract a different syndrome. And then this is the, and then you uh, have the bra that gives you to get the probability. So what I would like to do is to move these operators around the expectation value and put these they together. And why I want to do that? Because then all the operators that are local in space and time are together. And this becomes a very similar thing that we, to uh, what you do in uh, quantum phase transitions and uh, when you evaluate a partition function, for example. 
So most of the time you cannot do that. Well, it's very hard to do these commutations. But if you can work in perturbation theory, then you can use the commutation relations of the fields to do that. So let me give you an example where you actually can do this exactly. Just look at the uh, bosonic environment, which has a free Hamiltonian like this, a string, and that is interacting with some qubits, some spins. Okay, so there's a large cutoff lambda for the environment, and we want to protect this qubit using, for example, the three qubit code. You encode your information in these two code words. And then the evolution operator, the general evolution operator, is given by this difference between the dual fields of the bosonic variables times sigma z. So when you do the evolution right, and do the measurements, actually every time that you measure that you had an error in the first qubit, for example, what actually you have is the evolution given by the sign of this difference, so the imaginary part of this exponential, when you expand the exponential and cosine plus i sine. If you don't have an error, if you didn't measure an error for a given qubit, what you actually have is the cosine of the, evol the unitary evolution. So the general operator that you have, if you don't have any evolution, is the product of two cosines and the product of three, uh, three cosines and the product of three sines, which is the uncorrected error that comes to always together with the, uh, the evolution that error correction is protecting. So the same thing if you measure an error in the first qubit. Right. So you have one sine and two cosines and two cosines, and two, one cosine and two sines. So this is the uncorrected, the unprotected, the un un uncorrected error. So now if you measure, if you want to calculate a probability, then you have a sequence for a given his history of syndromes, you have a sequence of these operators and you want to evaluate this probability. So now you can precisely do what I did, what I was, what I showed in the diagrams that I showed before. You can go commute your operators around and put together all the things that are close in space and time. So now that you did that, you can, if because it's a free theory, you can use Vick's theorem and separate everything that is local than what is far away in space and time. So everything, and when you integrate the high frequency part, the local part, you get an uncorrelated probability. When I mean uncorrelated probability, is the probability of having that evolution um, the, the high frequency component of that evolution. And you have an operator, you can expand the operators and get the most singular terms in the expansion that will keep the track of the most divergent terms in the perturbation theory for the long times. So you have the uncorrelated part and the correlated one. This is doing, what I'm doing is a coarse grain in space time that kept, is keep track of the most divergent terms in the perturbation theory. Okay, so now you expand in powers of the coupling, and for example, imagine that uh, I had two errors. I measure two syndromes with errors in two different cycles of error correction. So I have the probability of having these two errors, the uncorrelated part, epsilon squared, and I also have contractions between terms, between the two, con the two cycles. So, but what you see that this goes as a very large power, one to two, t to the fourth. The difference between the, the two time between the two, the, the two um, error correction cycles. So, and why you have that large power? So you need to go back and trace exactly what you're doing, what you're doing. So if you have an omic environment, your general, your uh, propagator is one over t squared the difference in time squares. So if you go to a fourth order term in your perturbation theory, it will be typically of this form. We'll have the uh, two terms that, that goes as one square. But you also have four integrals to look at. So the times where the perturbation happens are unknown to you. So when you integrate this out, you get the usual log t 
for om that omic environments have. So, but when you have QEC, that's not exactly what's going on. When I'm doing the, when I do the coarse grain of time, actually now each one of these time variables represent that pre error correction period. They happen both at this. I always have them happening at the same QEC step. So, although I still have one over t to the fourth uh, for the correlator, correlators. Right? The number of integrals or that I need to do is half because now I know the times, half of the times that the errors occurred. So that's exactly what happens in the QEC. You, you have a very peculiar evolution and it's protecting you already from some uh, decoherence due to uh, correlations for long times and long distances. So you can even, because you have the separation scales, you can even think of something nice to do to if you need to reduce even further the correlations. So yesterday we learned about dynamical decoupling and one of the problems with dynamical decoupling well, original problem is that you need to act fast, faster than the cutoff. You need this very fa uh, that can be very large in this kind of problem that I'm looking at. Otherwise, the error probability increases. But I have a different scale than the cutoff, which is the period of the error correction. So I can now look at what happens when I do dynamical decoupling in this low frequency uh, when I have this separation of scales. So, so what, I'm, what I'm saying is that, okay, let me apply a knot gate, logical knot, exactly half of the period of the error correction. So the moment that you do that, you increase the local error probability because you're juggling the system a little bit more because you're doing operations. However, you decrease the correlated part. You get an extra power in the, in the operator, the coarse grain operator. So instead of one t to the fourth that I had before, I now have one t to the eighth. So this was the exact solvable problem. And uh, what I would like to do now is to go to the more general setting. So what I want is to go back and reduce the problem to the problem that I know. And one of the problem that I know is error correction with stochastic error models. Okay. <clears throat> so. What I'm going to, I'm going to start with a Hamiltonian. I'm going to define what is a not local error probability and identify the long range operators that do the correlations between different error QEC cycles. And uh, I studied how this long range correlators, long range correlations change the local error probability, if they can change that much or not. If they don't change a lot, then I can rely on everything that was done in, uh, in, the, uh, in the resilient quantum computation for the Markovian noise. So again, I start with a free Hamiltonian and I have to consider some parameters for my theory. The first one is the number of dimensions that I have, just the velocity of excitations that the environment can propagate, V, and the dynamical exponent. So how do I relate temporal and spatial correlations? Now that I have that, and I can still consider this general setting, this general form for the interaction, I have to do a simplification, an assumption. That, so let me define delta. So delta is the time that it takes me to do an error correction cycle. So in addition to that, let me define a, a spatial scale, which is related to delta which is the velocity that takes to, uh, of, that the waves, the, the signal propagates through the environment times uh, the time to do an error correction period, so one over the dynamical exponent. So, and why do I want to do that? Because I want to rely on the stochastic error models. So if I do that, if I assume that inside one, each of these cubes, there is just one qubit, then the excite, the information, well, the, 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 what happens in one qubit inside one error correction cycles remains there. And I can define what is a local error probability. So what I mean is that if this spin flips in one error correction cycle, the next cube, the next spin there, will not know there that until I already did the error correction. And that's what I want to do. So I can define the probability of having this flip here without 
knowing what's happening or what's going to, to happen with the qubit near, nearby. So in this sense, inside each one of the error correction cycles, I have an impurity problem because each spin doesn't know what's happening with the other ones. So, so it doesn't mean that there's no correlations in space and time. It just means that I have a low frequency component that correlates high, uh, flips or errors between different hypercubes and a high frequency component that is inside each one of the hypercubes. So you can do lowest order perturbation theory. And the reason that I want to do lowest order perturbation theory is because I need to do those commutations in the, in, to calculate the probabilities. And, but it's not, usual, it's not always fair to do that. So I need an estimate to know if I can do lowest order perturbation theory. So you can do the, so I, I just need to find out if I can or not. So one way to do this is perturbation theory improved by RG, renormalization group. Or you can sum diagrams, you can do whatever you, you, uh, methods you have available to you. If um, in, the case, in this case of perturbation theory improved by RG, I write the, exp the perturbative expansion with all the possible uh, terms in the series that are allowed by the QEC. So imagine that I have a certain error and I correct this error and now I have other t higher order terms in this series that also give me the same syndrome. So if I, when I do that and I start to integrate high frequency modes, I can define um, a perturbation uh, on RG equation to the coupling constant and sum a series of diagrams by integrating this differential equation in the, uh, this uh, RG equation. So I, if I integrate the, uh, the, all the frequencies from the cutoff until delta to the minus one, the time to do an error correction cycle, I have an estimate of how big or how small will be the uh, coupling constant um, at that time scale, at that frequency scale. So if this number in the end is a small, the renormalized coupling, then I can go back to my perturbation, th lowest order perturbation theory and replace the coupling by an effective coupling and only use the lowest order term. It's still fair, it's a good approximation. So correlations not always, are not always bad. You can, for example, lambda star can, be, can increase by RG, and that, for example, happens in the condo problem. But it can also decrease by RG if you have a quantum frustrated system, which is uh, a self pi pulse system where you have a, an uncorrelated noise in two different directions of the coupling and they start to compete with each other uh, to order the, the spin. But if, anyway, if this is a small number, at that scale, one over delta to the minus one, I can use this lowest order perturbation theory. Okay, so now I want to calculate the probabilities. And again, I have the same problem that I, the same problem that I have before. Uh, I have the operators that comes from the, bra, the cat evolution and the bra evolution, and I commute them, and I put them together, and I coarse grain the, the, the space and time. I uh, define what is the error probability of giving the, how a certain operator locally, and also an operator that is the coarse grain for that particular evolution. So, yeah. So now, so uh, now I have a perturbation th to explore a perturbation theory on those coarse grain operators and look at this for the stability of that perturbation theory, not the original perturbation theory that I was looking at. So that's, for example, let's say that I have m or n errors in this diagram, in space-time diagram. So each one of these is one of this, that hypercubes. So each one of them comes with a certain probability, stochastic probability, and I also have the correlated part, the contractions now between uh, possible perturbations in different cubes. So the zeroth order term in this new perturbation theory, right, is just the stochastic error probability. 
So there are no contractions. All the, con all the contractions of perturbations happen inside each one of the hypercubes. And this just is the stochastic part, probability of having M errors, and the, all the combinatorial factors that I can, uh, combinatorial possibilities of putting these M errors in the grid. But let's look at the first correction. So the first correction of this M errors right, will still uh, will have contractions between two different hypercubes. And this is the thing that I need to evaluate. So the moment that I do that, I, again, I assume that, that original form for the perturbation. But because I have that square in the evolution operator, because every time that I know that an error occurs, I know that it happens also in the bra and in the cat evolution. All my correlation functions comes with a square in, in their original exponent. Okay. So well, although I started with two delta and two delta over z for my correlation functions, QEC transformed that in four delta and four delta over z. So uh, this kind of perturbation will again have uh, a, if I would do the expansion, we'll have a leading divergent term. And this leading divergent term has exactly the same form as what I was doing before, but with an extra two that came purely from QEC. Okay? So this criteria defines the stability for the perturbation theory, just like I did, uh, I showed before for the unprotected system. So if d plus z minus 2 delta is smaller than 0, then you are f it's fair to use perturbation theory and calculate systematically corrections to it as you need it. But if d plus z minus 2 delta is larger than 0, then you may need a new derivation. You don't know what's going to happen. So this brings us to um, the scenario of a possible quantum phase transition. So, Professor, as I pointed out in Professor Zorinov's paper, so she was considering a low temperature regime where the computer and, uh, qubits can be strongly entangled with themselves. Uh, oh, sorry. And you have low decoherence, and the qubits and environments are weakly entangled between themselves, and qubits are strongly entangled among themselves. Then you can have a high temperature phase where the qubits and environment are strongly entangled and the uh, qubits are weakly entangled among themselves. And this is a signal of the strong decoherence. But now I also have the possibility that I'll have another low temperature phase where uh, the computer and the environment are strongly entangled among themselves and you, still, and you do have a strong decoherence. So let me put a diagram that will make more sense. So, if d plus z over 2, if you, are, is, if you are above the upper critical dimension, but now you have this extra factor of 2, if you are above this, high, uh, this, this upper critical dimension, then you can use the traditional threshold theorem. And, uh, and perturbation theory works, should work fine. And everything here is well defined, and, and, the, compute, and the computation can be uh, done for arbitrarily long times. Eventually, if you increase the local error probability, you cross to the noisy quantum computer that I was talking before, where you don't know how, you, don't, you are not allowed to do quantum computation anymore. But when you are below this upper critical dimension, there are different pos two possibilities. It may be that these strong correlations between your qubits are so strong that it's not possible to compute anymore. For example, your spin orders, they become an antiferromagnet, right, due to interactions mediated by the environment. Or uh, there may be a region where you still be able to define a quantum error correction method to protect your system, to extract enough entropy out of the system, uh, but uh, you need a new derivation. You cannot rely on the stochastic error models and the standard description. And so, is, so the point is we don't know what, if there is or not this, these two regions, or if there is just an impossible to produce, but to protect the qubits, it's more likely uh, the first scenario, I don't know, that it's possible, but uh, we need to find a new derivation. But we know for sure that if d plus z over 2 is, uh, if you are above the upper critical dimension, then you are fine. It's reasonable to use the stochastic error model. 
So to make an, uh, to give a point is that the omic case is usually considered as a marginal case, and subomic cases are very uh, lead to needs very strong corrections. Right, you have very strong entanglement, but the omic case will happen here in this diagram. Anyway. And we see that actually you are already protecting using quantum error correction in your system for a large set of subomic problems. So, my, the, so what I wanted to conclude is that we study the coherence in a quantum computer in a correlated environment, and uh, we show that there are some software methods that you can do, that uh, it's possible to derive the threshold theorem using the stochastic error models, even if you start with a cor strongly correlated environment. And there is a strong parallel with the theory of quantum phase transitions. Thank you very much. small delta? The small delta is, is the scaling dimension of the operator that gives you the noise. So it depends on your microscopic Hamiltonian. No, it depends. It depends on the microscopic Hamiltonian. You need to know what, your, what is the error model, or the error model, the Hamiltonian that, uh, that, that gives the interaction between the environment and the qubit. It just depends on that. No. So the problem with, well, there's not a problem, it's just that uh, Terhar and Burkhardt, they fall in the first category that I point out, that they need to use the operator norm, and the moment that they use the operator norm, they are limited to the bounded kind of errors, like so lambda t. Diagram, still the area where there are, uh, strong correlation, yeah. still I think that the best problem that we can, uh, the best place that we can actually compare is with the problem that Professor uh, Kit uh, Kitaev, uh, Preskill, and Aronov worked, uh, where they use correlations as 1 over R square, and they use the operator norm there, R, R square, R to a certain power between the qubits. And there you, get, you have exactly, you arrive at exactly the same criteria, so d plus z minus 2 delta. So that's the best place to compare. syndrome extraction uh, at a kind of uh, phenomenological level, uh, so uh, as far as I understand. Did you actually try to uh, also do the, the measurement process uh, at, at the animal level? No, uh, it's, just a, it's just a sharp measurement, right, projection. So do you have any intuition as to what would happen? Um, well, not really. I, I, I understand the measure very much in the Zurek like so it will be like a, another bath acting very fast and decohering the, the system very fast. So, um, but you're going to do that with, not with the qubits that I show, but with ancillas that are removed away from the general computer. So that may not be any, a big problem. I don't know. No more questions? Sure. <laughs>